unbothered, unleashed, and totally unscripted. It's Beyond the Roar with football head coach Eddie George. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Roar with me, Coach Eddie George. And I'm here with our great chief of staff, Dusty Bennett, or Dustin Bennett. All right. So, um, hey, man, so here we are, right? What's up, brother? You know, deep into uh, the season. Um, got here in what? In April, yeah. May, somewhere around that time. So, yeah. Just let's just backtrack a little bit. Um, Coach Jeff Fisher. Yep. Uh, gives you a call, right? And tells you about the opportunity. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Well, when he first called, he said, "There's a school that's looking to hire a coach." And I said, "Well, you know, what school is it, and where it's at?" So, of course, with it being Coach Fisher, you know, I've automatically, you know, knew Nashville. Um, my first thought was, "What a great situation that would be if it came to fruition." Uh, it was probably um, not too long after we had the first initial conversation that we connected. Probably the next day. Um, and then I headed up here to Nashville and then that's when I got to meet you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So when, so were you kind of like, well, you know, cause you've been around, I yeah. mean, listen, you've, uh, worked for Bob Davey right. at New Mexico. Yep. You started, um, the program, helped start the program at Georgia state. Yep. Um, so you've been around some seasoned coaches knowing that, Hey, you never met me before. You knew me of me probably from my right. playing days and didn't know what I was doing now. I mean, how serious did you think it was? What kind of situation do you think you were walking into? Well, I, I definitely know it was serious if Coach Fisher, you know, was involved in it when he called. Um, obviously, the things that the, um, you know, Dion and Prime's doing at Jackson State, that was in conversation when we first came up. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was really serious. I, I mean, I, I know you from when you were playing. I knew that you did some acting. I knew that you had a bunch <laughs> of other things on your plate at the time and the wealth management. And for me, the, being the money guy, I was like, well, he, he'll understand what it takes to, to build a program. And, you know, doing the due diligence on the backside to see exactly what, you know, Tennessee State was at that moment and what we could potentially make it, um, knowing that it was going to be a process. Mm-hmm. Patience yes, was that one of our biggest things that we talked about early on. Um, and, you know, my, my career – uh, has, you know, taught me a lot. You know, I started as an academic advisor. Um, that's what I originally started as in, in athletics, working with the football team at Georgia State. When we started it, I played baseball there, had a unique opportunity to work with Coach Bill Curry there on the academic side, and then moved into a director of football operations role with Trent Miles there. So spent a lot of time before going to New Mexico with Coach Davey. So I've seen it through a lot of different lenses, mm-hmm. from academics to finances to eligibility um, to, to be in a director of football operations and now here, uh, as a chief of staff, which, you know, you know, covers a little bit of a lot of things. Yeah. And I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned chief of staff because people, when they look at the, I guess the roster of coaches, um, they look at the chief of staff. It sounds like a really fancy name. Like, you're yeah, at, it's at not the head that. Of state. <laughs> Explain, describe your day to day. So um, a day in the life. So here, um, You know, Coach George and I, you know, we're rebuilding it literally from the ground up. And so, you know, the main focus for us, one is from a budgetary standpoint, a financial standpoint, making sure that it's viable, making sure it's sustainable, uh, making sure football is moving in the right direction. Um, You know, whether that's with conferences and realignments or players and recruiting. Um, The first project that we had was hiring a staff, you know, and Mm -hmm. working with Coach George and Coach Fisher. You know, we were able to identify identify those coaches across the country that would fit into what we were trying to do here, um, getting them onboarded. And then we made it through that process. And so a day right now for me is a little bit of equipment, a little bit of sports medicine, a little bit of uh, budget, a little bit of academics, a little bit of compliance, recruiting, um, uh, all the way down to making sure guys are taking care of immunizations, making sure, you know, traveling is set up and where we're going and how we're moving and shaking and whether we're flying or we're driving um, and paying the bills, keeping the lights turned on. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that, you know, we do is managing that and being good stewards of the university and uh, making sure that everything we do is fiscally responsible because when Coach George and I came in, it was an all-boats-rise mentality, and we had to get to that point. Um, and, you know, that's something that we've spent since April really working on. I think we've – recently turned a corner in what our vision is and what it's going to be for football. And that's from an infrastructure standpoint, a recruiting standpoint. Um, and, and, you know, with Dr. Allen's leadership uh, on the athletic director side, you know, he's really allowed me um, the autonomy to, to do those things. 
um, and working closely with Dr. Glover on what are our long-term strategic plans for football, but not only football, what can football help enhance at the university um, over, you know, the short term and the long term. So some, um, someone from the outside looking in may look at this situation and say, hey, how hard can it be to really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. run a university? You're saying all these things, but really the things you come in, it's pretty much everything the culture said, things are in place. What's been the most challenging part of your day-to-day duties? Oh, man. Um, I think th- for me, patience is my most challenging thing because, you know, I'm a right, right now type of person. I think um, that that is really challenging for me to slow down sometimes and to see the long term um, because I think we have a unique opportunity here at TSU to to really make an impact quickly. Um, outside of that, I think the most challenging thing is the, you know, with players, when you're, when you're talking about athletics and you're talking about student athletes and you're talking about what they go through, a lot of people just see them as football players. They don't see them as finance majors or architecture majors or whatever that is and the things that they go through in their daily life. So some of the challenging things for me are making sure that we put them in the best position to be successful you know, people outside of players. And so whether that's how dealing with housing or dealing with, Mm -hmm. you know, financial aid stuff. And, you know, we have players that have children and making sure that they're taken care of. So it's not necessarily that it's challenging to me. It's more of a, a challenge to make sure that they have all of the things that they need to be successful here. Mm -hmm. Describe for me your leadership style. Oh man. Well, I'm definitely hands on. (laughs) (laughs) I think you know that about me. Um, You know, I learned from uh, quite a few different managers in my time uh, working in athletics. And so I've taken a little bit from each of those. I'm definitely laid back in my leadership style. Um, You know, I I, I take an approach to where, you know, you have a job. um, We try to provide you the resources and um, give you the autonomy and the accountability to do it how you see fit. I definitely don't micromanage. Um, I think it's important that everybody has their own style and, you know, we're lucky at TSU where we have quite a bit of personality mm-hmm. <laughs> in our hallway and managing that. I think personalities you manage personality management is probably one of the biggest things that you and I do right. um, on a day to day basis and making sure that everybody has what they need. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that's it. I, I, I'm pretty laid back, easy going. Um, at first, you know, you take things really serious because you want it to happen. Right. And we've come to, um, really practice that word patience uh, a lot around um, here in the last, you know, four or five months and knowing that it's coming, we know that we're doing the right thing. We know that we're pushing in the right direction, but sometimes you want it tomorrow and you just can't wait. Yeah, I know it's, it's like <laughs> it has, it happens at its time on time. You right. got to cultivate it. You've got to nurture it. You've got to be persistent, but you have to allow it to manifest at its own time. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the, the, the key to it. So how would you strengthen the relationship between, I guess, your leadership and staff members? How does that, how does it look from your perspective? Well, you know, the, you know, I've learned early on is that in order to strengthen that, strengthen that relationship, you have to build, build the relationship first. You know, I've encountered, you know, a few situations here already where you really have to hear what people are going through and making sure that it aligns with, you know, what you want to accomplish as a program. I think it's easy for us to sit around and we know what we need to be successful, but making sure that, you know, the, the staff members have what they need. I mean, we've had things where, you know, people not getting paid or like what it is and working through all of the things that we have to work through um, because it's important that we do those things and know where they're coming from because they're coming in the office every day, just like everybody and working really hard. And we want to make sure that they're taken care of. So sometimes early on, I think it was easy just to, to, to say, well, you don't know how to do it or, mm-hmm. you know, we need to move mm-hmm. on or, and it's really transitioned into of what resources do you need and what leadership do we need to bring in the building in those areas to help enhance, you know, your va- the value that you bring to our program. Yeah. You know, you said hearing and I, I equate that to listening yeah. as, as the most important skill you can have as a leader. Um, and ironically enough, um, listening, being on stage, that taught me that skill to listen. Yeah. As an actor, you have to listen in order to react. Right. You know, and you react in an honest, truthful way. So if you're really listening to that individual and 
not just the words they're, they're saying, but their body language, what they're going through, it changes everything, everything in terms of it shifts in terms of, okay, I'm really not dealing with a business problem. I'm dealing with a human problem. That's he right. might be tired or worn down or dealing with issues outside of it because we're all dealing with something right. outside the walls of TSU and football and you have to manage that. You know, that's the one thing that I that I've learned, you know. So um yeah, I just thought I would Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. I mean listening is the biggest thing and you know, it was I think we had a lot of goals early that we wanted to accomplish quickly and then we've gotten to know one another better, you know, over the last few months. So listening is um something that I work on every day to be better at. I think everybody um, should do that and try to figure out ways that we can, you know, bring the the group closer. I think in my role, like as a chief of staff, sometimes the easy way out is to say, we're just going to get somebody new or do something different. And Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe in that. I don't think that that's the right answer. I think that the answer is to see what we have um, and how can we provide them the resources that they need to be successful and then go from there. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you, and it's been a, it's been a process for me because it's been I'm I'm tied between two different worlds. Is partially your world, and then partially as a football coach, I'm not right. in the trenches on either one. I'm like in that um, what do you what do you call it um, that space purgatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like okay, I'm not quite here, but I'm not quite over here. But I had to have a blend of both, and it's been. Um, it's been a lot of fun, honestly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lot of work. It uh, it can be nerve wracking, but to see the end result in the terms of the kids um, being happy about what they're seeing, the right. turnaround, and they're starting to see the fruits of their success from your perspective and from what you do, and certainly from on the field, it is it is gratifying. It's so gratifying yeah, and being able to give them the things that they need, like, you know, whether it's the Under Armour deal that we were able to put right. together, or, you know, um, new gear in the sense of protective gear, things that fans don't even see that we were able to enhance, mm-hmm. um, you know, infrastructure stuff that we're starting on with a new weight room and lockers are coming, new locker room and, you know, potentially a football operations building. Um, so, like, there's there's so many things that happen behind the scenes that, you know, aren't brought to – to light always for everybody to mm-hmm. see, but we know they're happening. And um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's uh, all based on student athlete welfare and whatever we can do to enhance that. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. That's it. So we're approaching halftime right now. So here's our Tennessee State fun fact question. Uh, here's for you. You oh can't look at the answers. You pride yourself on. Uh, being the almanac and knowing a lot of different oh, things. There's, let's, uh, let's, let's, no, no, let's, let's just see. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, what year did Tennessee State University have its first football season? Ding, 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 ding. 1916? Ding, ding. Close. 1914. Nope, you don't get one answer. No, 1912. I thought the school started in 1912. You sure football, football started season, in 1912? 1912. I don't know. I'll have to check you on that. Uh, yeah, 19, you got your I phone right there. Check I it, man. You can, you can check it right now. Okay. 1912 was the first football season. Are you sure? I, listen, I'm just going off of what's on the sheet. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure it's 1914. Are you going to put a, uh, gonna a Coke it. on that? You're going to put a Coke on that? <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> like a Coca-Cola. I'll, I'll like, confirm it. I'll yeah, confirm it right. after right. this. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump into our third quarter and get more personal with you. And you, you um, are a unique guy yourself. Um, you're an entrepreneur. You've uh, started various businesses. You've you're um, uh, into the arts. You have yeah. plenty of tattoos. <laughs> um, you build things. You, I still have a grill that you gave me. I have yet to put together, <laughs> by the way. But <Yeah>. anyway. <laughs> 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 but I want to know, how do you start your day? Well, uh, first, you know, I, I have uh, a beautiful wife, um, and we have four children. I have two boys and two girls. They're adorable, by the and way. so, yes. <clears throat> you know, I the start clan. my day with chaos. I think Rian and I both uh, will say that, but my girls are everything. So are my boys. So getting them up, getting them going. Um, because of the world that we work in, sometimes you get to see them once. You either get to see them before you leave or, you know, by the time you come home, they're already asleep. So I make it a point uh, to touch, um, 
you know, to, to connect with each of them in a different way in the morning um, before they start. They're on fall break now, so I've had quite the experience um, so far. But I don't really have any other routines. I'm not a coffee drinker. Um, you know, I really don't watch the news. I mean, I keep up with it enough to be dangerous, mm-hmm. you know, in conversations. But, you know, I just usually get up and Rian and I will get the kids going and then we'll have a short conversation before, you know, heading into the office. What do you what have you learned about being a father? Man, well, patience, one of them, back to the same word. Um, um, man, the biggest thing that I've learned <clears throat> about being a dad is commitment. <clears throat> it's frustrating. You know, sometimes, you know, they're painting walls and crayons or doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm committed to them. I, I was a young dad, um, you know, early 20s when I had my first son. Um, there was really no manual given to me. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I think I think it's unique for me to um, – my, my children are biracial growing up in the South. And so that conversation, you know, was early on, you know, is, you know, I'm from originally from a city right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I went to Georgia state, um, met my wife in Atlanta. She, she went to school in New Orleans and then came over to Atlanta. Um, and when we had Dustin, I think, you know, it was unique for us, right. You know, cause, cause we didn't look like the typical couple that we were friends with. And so, I think being committed to that um, relationship, being committed to my kids and what their goals are and what they want to accomplish, I think is the most important thing for me as a dad. Mm, mm. So, I mean, mean, that that's that's, given the times (laughs) that we're living in right now. Yeah, you know, it's 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 tough, and we deal with it. We've dealt with it. Um, My children, you know, see it through a different optics, right? You know, because race is um, definitely communicated differently now than it was when I grew up and when my wife grew up. Um, My wife's family's from the Virgin Islands, and so it's a different, you know, perspective. And the melting pot uh, of the world right now is unique. Um, But my, you know, our our, our thing as parents at home and, and being in a time like this is that, you know, we love our kids and teach our kids and we don't really get into those conversations. I mean, we do enough to, to communicate that they're best of both worlds, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? So, and, you know, as a dad being protective of them and, um, how the world views them because they're all like, you mean, you know, them all. And so like, they're all different. They all look different. They all like, you know, and they're all have their own unique personality. Um, so I think it's, I think it's just important for me to, you know, just be committed to whatever that is and, and knowing that, with Rihanna, no matter what we go through, you know, that I'll, I'll be there even in the toughest of times for my kids and her. Yes. So, yes, you know, I, I agree. I mean, you have a beautiful family. And the one thing that I've learned is outside of patience is compassion. Yeah. You know, compassion for my kids. I, I, I mean that it kind of, when they make a mistake or they do something that I will scold them for, I have to remember that I was once too. That's right. A 15 year old or 16 year old or 24 year old and looking at um, them through the eyes of a 48 year old man who's been through a wealth of experiences. It's almost like I expect them to learn, but now I have to show a lot of compassion in a, a real way. And it changes how I approach them with different things, you know, yeah. as I've gotten older. So, um, shifting gears a little bit, what was your best and worst subject in grade school? Oh, I was good at everything, so it's hard <laughs> to decide. That, no. um, the, the sciences, um, you know, I didn't really like them too much. The arts are always my, you know, jam. Arts, yeah. I mean, I'm good at math, and, you know, I went uh, to college. I actually majored in art history. Um, that's what I studied in school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a huge passion for arts. Favorite yeah. artist. Uh, well, when I studied in school, it was architecture. So Frank Lloyd Wright is Frank Lloyd Wright. <clears throat> so falling water and the, the, the things that he did, I was obsessed with that type of stuff. This mm-hmm. Georgia state didn't have an engineering school and architecture. I probably would have done that. Um, art history was the closest thing that I could get to didn't he, studying. Didn't he design, um, uh, uh house Central Park? Some of it, I believe. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you know, I, I like Scream by Edward Munt. Um, I think he's one of my favorites. Uh, I mean, obviously, the traditional Picassos and, and those things I'm into. Um, I'm a Banksy street artist guy, too. I like Banksy. And so, like, uh, you know, I enjoy that side of it. Tattoos I enjoy. You know, like, I, you know, you know that about me. And um, But 
science probably the worst, arts being the best. Mm, okay. What's the first thing that you notice when you first meet someone? Because you, you're, you're a great observer. <laughs> You notice something like somebody has a huge head or <laughs> they got a pimple like right here on the side of their face. Yeah. And yeah. What's the first thing that you notice? Um, I can read personalities pretty well. So if, if they're, if talking then personality, if not talking posture. Um, so I think those are the two things that I observe the first, um, like I definitely thought you had a really small head when I first met you for the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, people think that, yeah. <laughs> and we need to replay the signing day when on was it the fourteenth of April when they gave you the extra extra large hat and you put it on oh, and yes. sign it. That was my favorite moment. Yes, it was when huge. you put it on his head and it was like a just a five gallon bucket. <laughs> <laughs> See, yes, I'm saying you notice, you notice yeah, the, weird the little things, things. about people. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the little things, like the small head. <laughs> I, got, I got you. That, that's funny. <laughs> um, would you rather lose the ability to cry or cry every day for 20 minutes randomly? I think I would cry every day for 20 minutes randomly. Why? I think that lets your most, I think resetting and recharging. I think crying is an important part of what we do as humans to, you know, reset and recharge. It's refreshing. Re it is refreshing it is sometimes. Refreshing. Yeah. So I would definitely not want to lose that ability. Any regrets? Yeah. Uh, man. Personally, no. I mean, I think my, you know, my life has taken a course and, you know, man of faith and man of understanding where I'm, where I'm need to be right now. Um, man, I, I think the biggest regret that I have uh, as a young man would be not to be as uh, aggressive with what I wanted to accomplish in my goals. I was very complacent. Um, mm. And so... You don't strike me as that. But. No, I was early on. I, you know, I was just like, I have a job, I have benefits, everything is good. I, and I really wasn't focused on chasing, um, you know, exactly what I wanted to do or, you know, in, in those areas. And... You know, Rihanna's been a huge, was a huge part of that for me, getting married. My wife is awesome. She's, you know, uh, very well educated and had a, has accomplished her own stuff in her own way. And mm -hmm. um, she pushed me. She's like, you got to chase your goals. And so I, you know, the first leap of, you know, I took probably a little bit too late, like to, to my next, prof you know, job to grow. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my professional grad. Personally, you know, I don't, I don't have any personal regrets. I mean, I think there is some relationships that I would have kept um, better, you know, been better stewards of, like, you know, growing up and, mm -hmm. and as a young adult, um, I have a great family. <clears throat> um, you know, I have a brother and a sister who are in, in Georgia and my mom and dad are still in Georgia. Um, I think building probably a, maybe a closer relationship with them as a, as an adult, because you get caught up in wanting to chase everything you want to do mm -hmm. and you forget about the people that really helped you. Um, get there. So those are the, those are the two things that, you know, I think about when I, I don't know if regrets the right word, or maybe I would have tried to alter them. Maybe okay. I altered deal. Yeah. Well, good. All right. We're going to jump into our two minute rapid questions. Oh, so you man. ready for two minute drill? All right. Here's the situation. We have 75 yards to go. Uh, 52 seconds on the clock. No timeouts. Need a touchdown to win. You ready? Let's go. All right. Here we go. All right. What's your favorite music genre? Rap. Okay. What is your favorite thing to cook? Hot wings. Mm. <laughs> Do you eat pineapples on your pizza? No. Favorite movie? Um, Thomas Crown Affair. I love it. See, which, <laughs> which, which, yeah. which version? The first one. I like the second one too, though, but I, the, the remake was good, but the original is really good. Yeah, 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 you can't awesome. really get you can't. better than Absolutely. the original. What is, what's your nickname growing up? Scrappy. Scrappy, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and there yeah. we have it. Hey, yeah. thank you for joining me for another episode of Beyond the Roar with our great Chief of Staff, Dusty Bennett. We'll see you next time, Beyond the Roar. See you soon. Mm -hmm.